Well, the moment you've been waiting for, Megan Barth, the founder of ReaganBaby.com, is with us. Hi, Megan. How are you? Hey, Doc. I'm, I'm really good. How are you? Fantastic. Well, a lot good. better after last night, I'll tell you that. That was a heck of a night we saw in that GOP debate. Yes, it was. I'm glad it started the way it did with Ryan Priebus basically coming out, introducing the debate, and telling everybody in the audience and everyone in the viewing audience that no matter who the nominee is, the GOP is going to be behind them. And that needed to be said, I think, because there was a lot of distrust uh, in the general public as well as probably amongst the candidates. That's an excellent point. Were you surprised he did that? I think, it, you know, I've met Reince before and I've talked to him and I've watched him, of course, because that's my, my gig. Uh, you know, I, I'm glad that he did. It was a smart move and he's a smart guy. Uh, you know, he, he is well respected. He, team, he seems to be even keel. And uh, I think that he definitely caught the sense of the American public when you see the outsiders like Cruz and Trump rise. But yet you see the pundits on the right crucifying, as well as the other nominees, uh, insulting the outsiders uh, very personally, with personal attacks, uh, specifically Trump. So I think he kind of needed to herd the cats, so to speak, and really kind of set some decorum and set some standards, evoke Reagan's 11th Amendment again, and realize that this election is not necessarily about Democrats versus Republicans. This is a battle of ideology. This is a battle of are we going down the path on a freight train, quite frankly, with Obama and as well as with Hillary Clinton towards socialism? Are we adopting the tenets of socialism or are we going to stop that train, regroup, and have the capitalists, the free markets, the free enterprise, what America was founded upon? Are we going to, to return to those roots with this next election? So I, I view this next election as a battle of ideologies rather than really a battle of parties. That's a good point. I like that. It, it really astounds me, and I think they're starting to get it, or at least some of the candidates are, and you can tell me what you think. But there seems to be, they don't realize when you attack a certain candidate, you're really attacking the supporters a lot of times because these people are making a commitment they're putting out their person, they're putting out themselves to say, I support Donald Trump, I support Ted Cruz, whatever it is. And once you commit like that, you're saying to the world and to other people, this is this is part of you. And when the candidates attack other candidates like that, you're even attacking the supporters. Uh, and I've said that before, so we're thinking alike. You know, when you attack Trump, you're attacking millions of people by calling them Trumpsters, by calling them ignorant by calling them low information. You know, I have a lot of family members that are Trump supporters. I have not endorsed anybody yet because I believe it's a little bit too early. I have my favorites, uh, but you never know what's going to happen. Uh, but, when you, but when they do assault and attack and use vicious language and memes, they're really doing themselves and the conservative cause a huge dis uh, injustice. Absolutely. I have family members as well who are Trump supporters and I'm looking at that and looking at some of those articles we've seen, I think, in the Washington Post or New York Times. One of those newspapers wrote an article about the, how uneducated the Trump supporters were. And I have, you know, my, on my family, I have Democrats and Republicans. And specifically with the Republicans, they've been lifelong conservatives, military members who have served, uh, uh, walked precincts for candidates. They've given their time, their money, and their energy to the GOP for their entire lives, their entire voting lives. So to question their conservatism, I don't think is a fair, a, a fair way to do it, because I think what we should be doing is questioning the establishment's conservatism and putting the establishment on, on notice. And that is exactly what Trump supporters, I believe, are doing. And that's how Trump has risen and continues to dominate in the polls, because he is, he is challenging the establishment. He is saying, look, you guys, the Republicans and Democrats have given us the mess that we're in now. Now, granted, Obama has done a lot of damage in the seven years that he's been in office, specifically when he had control of the Congress. And he, he promises to be audacious, those are his words, uh, in his executive actions right. until so. he leaves. So, you know, let's point the turrets outside and, and away and, and quit with the circular firing squad and really understand that the battle 
is not parties. The battle is not within the conservative movement. The battle is the ideology between socialism and free market capitalism. Absolutely. Well said. So let's get to the GOP debate. What's the first thing that stood out for you? Well, I loved the first thing that stood out for me was the way that the moderators ignored the first two, the, the leading two candidates, uh, Trump and Cruz. That's right. <laughs> it really did. And it gave us a window into uh, the underdogs and what I would consider the establishment candidates. They didn't ask Trump or Cruz a question for, I want to say, six questions, maybe seven. I'll have to review it. But it was a while before we heard from the leaders. I kind of liked that style, and I also liked it because they didn't start with defend yourself against these Trump attacks, or defend yourself against Cruz, or defend yourself against Rubio. They really got into the substance of the issues, like the economy, foreign policy, immigration, you know, all these domestic policies. That's what the American people are concerned with right now, their pocketbook and their safety. So when they started out talking about these very important subjects, I thought, wonderful. We're not going to get into a grudge match, and we're really going to get some substance out of this debate. That's what struck me at first. And I thought, if, we're, if they hold this tone, we're in good shape. And they did. Yeah, Fox Business has done a fabulous job with those debates. Yeah, exactly. I would want them to host pretty much all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A little bit of a deep talk, but you know, I think that they asked great questions um, and got some really good, solid answers. And one thing I did notice too is that Trump really has has seemed, excuse me, seems to have come along, meaning that mm -hmm. he's a businessman. You know, he's he, he's not a politician. He's not a debater. He's used to giving speeches where people listen. He's used to doing deals. Uh, so what I found in his tone, it was a little bit uh, less less bombastic, uh, and he was very he was more fluid, uh, a little bit more I would say coached but not rehearsed. He's Specific smart. Oh, come on! You can't build a ten billion dollar organization on stupidity. Absolutely. I mean, I mean the, the adaptability he's had, as you mentioned, to become a politician, basically what he's doing in these debates. I mean, you're standing in front of millions of people, and somebody like that, usually most people defer to him. They don't attack him, and now he's actually in the main stage being attacked, <laughs> and he has to respond, which I think was amazing, and, re and really watching it last night. And one thing I did notice, too, is that Jeb Bush didn't attack him. Wasn't that interesting, especially coming off the Nikki Haley attack, which, by the way, I was uh, completely taken aback by and disappointed in Nikki Haley. Reason being, she had the perfect opportunity to use Obama's delusion and illusion, delusional and illusion SOTU, State of the Union address. She could have poked holes in that address. It's so easy. And instead, she used a national platform to attack the leading GOP nominee, not by name, indirectly, but then the next day she said he was part of that attack. And I thought it was really beneath the office of the governorship of South Carolina, and I thought it was beneath the standards that should have been set by the GOP. Yet, 24 hours later, maybe 48 hours later, you see Jeb Bush kind of shrink back from that attack and ask Donald to reconsider his immigration proposal, whereby there would be a temporary Muslim ban. That's very different language coming from Jeb Bush. Perhaps they're learning their lesson. Don't attack. <laughs> I don't even know if it matters at this point. Do you? Well, he just cut Lindsey Graham's nomination, so he picked up six more voters. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And right after our commercial break, we're going to take one in a few minutes, but I just want to get the listeners to be aware of it. After the commercial break, we're going to find out Megan Bart's favorite segment of the debate. But anyway, as we we're going to go on, um, yeah, that's fascinating because Jeb Bush is in, uh, I think he's in a world of trouble. Carson didn't seem to play very much either. What do you think about him? If I could use the words of Trump, low energy, <laughs> very, very <laughs> passionate person, very brilliant man, uh, a, a man who has built his life on uh, compassion as well as setting standards and having integrity and having dignity. And he mentioned that in his, in his address to a question, which I don't recall which one it was. But, oh, it was the Bill Clinton question. Was Bill Clinton fair game in the Hillary attacks? 
And he's and he basically didn't say yes or no, but he said, you know, we have a moral problem in this country whereby this type of behavior is somehow acceptable. And we need to find out, we need to change that. What happened? You read five comments down on an article about Ben Carson, and he said all of a sudden people are attacking each other. He said, how did we get this way? You know, we need to have, you know, more of a, a moral, ethical compass uh, and, and set some standards of decency. And, I, and, I, and he's a decent man. I'd love to see him appointed uh, for, I don't know if it's, U.S. Uh, general, as far as, or heading up the VA, I think heading up the VA would be wonderful for him to do. That's a good point. And I actually, I like him a lot as well. And it's actually kind of sad because they, they've mocked him so heavily over the last few weeks about him not knowing very much about foreign policy and almost making him look kind of, um, I don't want to say dumb, but it just made him look uninformed. And it was kind of sad to see that it was a tax on him because he is such a nice guy. Yeah, well, in the world that we live in now, especially with ISIS having the, the caliphate the size of Indiana and with attacks going on in our homeland in like San Bernardino and up in Oregon and Chattanooga and Garland, Texas and Boston and New York and Minnesota and, and Santa Clara, everywhere you look, it seems like there's terror here, terror there, terror everywhere. And this is not an on-the-job training type of of position, I, I believe he has the aptitude. I believe, ju just like Trump, they have the aptitude, but the team is very important on who they put around him. And when it comes to leadership and demonstrating leadership, Trump trumps Carson in that way. He has a much more stronger, I would say, presence, and he grabs onto an issue and leads with it. No matter if he doesn't necessarily know everything about it, he makes you believe that he'll get the job done. That's where Carson kind of falls short. That's a great point. That's exactly what, how I feel, and I think psychologically, that's what a lot of people feel. He just makes you feel secure. That he may not know it, but he's going to get it done no matter what. Yeah, and, and statistics show I'm kind of a statistic person. They don't lie unless it's a false study. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. uh, statistics show that women, and, and actually the GOP ran, when, when Reagan was running, they, they of course do all these demographic studies on how to appeal you know, to different groups. And they found very simply that women and men vote very similarly. And the main reason that women will vote for a candidate, no matter what party, is that, and man, men, they will vote for a candidate who they can trust. That's it. So when it comes to trust, Marco Rubio has that problem. And I think that's why he's lagging. He's an excellent orator. Last night, he really brought some heat. You know, he was very strong. A very He punched every line Absolutely. that he wanted to cross. Uh, so he was showing that leadership side. However, trust is dragging him back because of his gang of eight, because he was doing deals just a short two years ago with the likes of Chuck Schumer, which would have decimated our immigration laws and uh, through amnesty and also hurt our economy um, and probably increased the size of our sanctuary cities, which we want to eliminate those. So he has a trust issue that he has to overcome, not only with me, but from what I hear, and I think just from what I see. Yeah, the interesting thing about Rubio, in my opinion, I think he, I personally think he should be dropping out soon, and not because of Trump or anybody else. I just think he could really benefit himself if he drops out, comes back four to eight years, much more season. I think dropping out of the Senate was a mistake. I just think he's a little early. Yeah, you know, I, I've watched him for a long time, and I and I thought, and I've always had respect for him. I, I, like I said, I think he uh, lost his way a little bit and lost some of that respect, and that I think comes with a little bit of of youth, and whereby his youth can also be molded by the establishment. And he he isn't a trailblazer, much like Cruz, whereby Cruz will filibuster Obamacare. Uh, and take a stand against the establishment. This shows strength. This shows leadership, capitulation. When they talk about bipartisanship, when the Democrats talk about bipartisanship, they're talking about capitulation. We don't need to capitulate. We don't need to abandon our principles. We can negotiate. 
But when you abandon your principles, it's capitulation and you don't have a leg to stand on. Absolutely. So, Megan, we were talking a little bit about the debates and we got into Rubio. Uh, I want to cover a little bit more about the reality of Cruz in a minute. But what was your favorite battle last night? I, I just love the quips that come out of Christie. He, he's this East Coast class and sass kind of guy, delivers a punch. And when, when Marco was asking for extra time, he's like, Marco, you blew it. <laughs> Let this governor handle it. Let's go ahead and play that clip really quickly here. We're going to show that clip that Megan was referencing because it was. It's a classic. Do you remember that, everybody? This was a question on entitlements. Oh, I'll answer and the, the, and the reason, And the reason, now you already had your chance, Marco, you blew it. Um, here's the thing. <laughs> he got a little bit of a blowback from the crowd. Did that crowd seem lopsided to you? Something was off with that crowd last night. Yeah, but you know, I went to the Republican debate and sat in the audience in Vegas. And that crowd was definitely lopsided too. You know, tickets aren't handed out like candy to debates. They're, they're handed out uh, to the largest donors. They're handed out to some of the other folks. And you know, I'm not really sure if you can buy tickets to the debate. I, I was fortunate enough to know somebody. Uh, but it, it, it tends to be, from just my limited experience, more of a donor-based crowd. So if Jeb had a lot of supporters, if Marco had a lot of supporters, uh, they would probably have a good, you know, good amount of folks in there, and, and that would show the lopsidedness. That's interesting. That, if, if, I think somebody mentioned that Jeb did have a lot of supporters. I'm just wondering if that was like a final test for them. You know, this is a big debate for you. Are you going to pull it off? And it didn't seem like he really did. Uh, no, you know, he fell short. He came out very weak. Yeah. If you noticed, yeah. nearly nervous. Yes. He, he, and after this long in public office, and especially on this campaign trail, you don't expect nervousness out of the gate. Uh, and it om almost seems like he's not sure of himself. Like he doesn't trust what's going to come out of his mouth. Like he doesn't have this... Um, what's the word I'm looking for, nearly this uh, conviction of what he's saying. Do you think he, Trump got to him? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Trump has a way of doing that. He can rattle. He even rattled, and, th and this is where Trump really surprised me. When he was in full debate with Cruz, and Cruz mentioned the New York values. Oh, yeah. And Trump took that and counter-debated it, and won because Cruz started clapping. Cruz is a champion debater, <laughs> and he beat him. And, and, and Bush simply doesn't have that ability. Absolutely. And he had a I lot think... of statements, too. I don't know if you noticed. Bush had a lot of misstatements. Yeah, he did. I did notice a little bit of that. I mean, I was kind of actually tuning him out a little bit. Yeah. I, I tuned Bush and Kasich out a little bit. You too? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kasich, for me, for some reason, looks like he has 10 cups of coffee before he gets up on stage. He's constantly moving. He's Shopping all over the place. Face. He looks very, I don't know, what's going on with that guy? He's doing like kung fu fighting all the time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I was getting ready to kick the podium over. Very unusual. Sorry. What did you think about the Rubio Cruz fight? That was a really good one. That was great. That that showed us a couple of things. One, you've got uh, senators, two senators, that rode in pretty much on the coattails of the Tea Party and fought their way to get into the Senate. So you expect them to have similar ideals, but you see what happens when some folks get into the halls of Congress. Like I said, the influence and the influence peddling that goes on there, whereby Rubio... Rubio was willing to be persuaded and schnookered, quite frankly, by Chuck, Chuck Schumer to do deals. And yet you have Cruz, who is still standing on his, what I would call his Tea Party platform, the folks that helped him win. He was up against, like he said last night, against a guy with a bank of $200 million. And he won. So he had grassroots support. So you saw the differences between them, uh, and Rubio was giving a long list of, can of, of problems that he had as far as Cruz's voting record or, and such, 
and how he's flip-flopped on, on ethanol and corn subsidies. And then you have Cruz coming back and saying, oh, that's not true. So it was just par for the course. You've got these two senators trying to prove who's more conservative than the other. And, and Rubio actually labeled him uh, as questionably conservative based on his voting record. I can't remember the exact two words he used. But Rubio should be careful with that. We actually have Very a question for you. Evelyn from Louisiana wants to know, do you, who do you think actually moved, either up or down? You know, I think you're going to see, uh, I think you're going to see a little bit of a bounce in Christie. Huh. I think Jeb, the last poll I saw, Jeb was at third above Rubio. I think that's, false. Uh, I think he's going to go down. I think you're going to see Kasich drop, although I see Kasich's doing about third in New Hampshire. Um, Rubio, I think, will stay. He might get a little bit of a point here and there, but I don't think you're going to see any huge spikes. I don't know that anyone from the happy hour is going to come up to the main stage. I'm hoping that happy hour debate actually goes away. I'd like to actually have a happy hour at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to narrow the field, uh, thin the herd. Um, but I think you might see a little pop in Christie because of his gravitas, because he brings this this kind of sense of, you know, you know uh, wise guy, but leadership too. And he was attacking Hillary Clinton. He was one of the first people to level attacks against Hillary Clinton. And that's what these candidates need to do because she's presumably the nominee with or without an indict indictment. Uh, but I think once she gets an indictment, she's out. Although 43% of Democrats would still vote for her if she was indicted. So that tells you quite a little, a lot about the mindset of <laughs> the ethical bankruptcy, which exists on the left. We got two minutes to go here. I want to give you a uh, speed round. Are you ready? Oh, okay, sure. Unfortunately, we have two minutes. We can be here all day, can't we? Just chit-chatting. I know, I know. Um, the speed round starts off like this. You see some of the assumptions that I'm making right now. One of the assumptions is we've been doing this now for, what, seven months? We've had over six, seven debates with these guys. To me, it seems like everybody pretty much knows who they're going to go for. Yes. I think that's true. Yeah, I think everybody has, you know, and with the exception of me, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> I have my favorites, but you, you look at the polls and you can see the general sense of the American public. Iowa is going to obviously be a huge arbinger. Yeah, Iowa's going to be interesting. That, that could be the most confusing one at the moment. And the other assumption is, you know, Biden came out this week attacking Hillary, in a sense, with his inequality comment. Um, he also came out saying he regretted not jumping in. You know, I've talked to FBI before. They say nothing leaks. Just weird timing here. It sounds like, you know, if there's an indictment of Hillary, Biden could just put his foot right in and jump right through. What do you think? Exactly. He also praised Sanders. And okay. move on and move on.org. Uh, move on.org got behind Sanders. The SEIU chief who is in the back pocket of usually the Clintons and the Democrats said she could not commit. So Hillary is not out, Hillary is not fundraising like they expected her to. She's paid the DNC $15 million even before the Ohio primary, which has never been done before in history. They usually wait till the nom to feed the, the DNC or the RNC through fundraising. So huh. the fix yeah. is in, I think, for Hillary. I think they thought that this server issue was just going to go away. But unfortunately, emails don't disappear. And fortunately, a federal judge has forced them to release these emails on a weekly basis, whereby the administrator, or excuse me, the Secretary of State was not going to do it until 2016, until this year. So the facts are catching up with her, the lies are catching up with her, and the FBI expanded their investigation to include corruption of this, the Clinton Foundation with a quid pro quo arrangement between the Secretary of State and the donors of the Clinton Foundation. 100 and F 150 FBI agents are on this. And when you expand an FBI investigation, that's not a good thing. Things yeah, aren't looking good. For I'd rather have her run than Biden because I called seven months ago, eight months ago, perhaps, uh, that it could be a Biden-Warren ticket. And if it's a Biden-Warren ticket, we are going to have a tough, tough battle. I know, but I'll miss the gaffes if he doesn't run. Oh, he's not going away. Oh, all right. <laughs> 
Megan Barr, thank you so much for being here. We truly appreciate it. Dr. Kyle, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and congratulations on your new show. Thank you. And where can we get more information about you? Uh, Reaganbaby.com is my website. Uh, Reagan underscore baby is my Twitter page and or handle. And I have a Facebook fan page, uh, Reagan Baby. There you go, everyone. Reaganbaby.com. I'm telling you, great articles. You will not be disappointed. You don't want to miss them. Go to Reaganbaby.com.